Would you please give a Rock Family Worship Center welcome to Ray Hughes as he comes to minister to us. I'm good, man. Well, good good evening, y'all. It, it is so really, really is good to be here, and that's not just some token greeting. That's it's good to be in this place and to be with in the middle of what God's doing with you guys. And uh, I thought tonight was just absolutely beautiful. These uh, amazing singers the Lord's put in this house, the musicians that the Lord's put here, and uh, I just want to remind all of us as we get going here just just how valuable it is uh, what they do when they when they charge the atmosphere with uh, passion married to melody and uh, you know Mark Twain said that the two most important days of a man's life turns out to be the day you're born and the day you find out why and um, what you have here is um, you know, I looked at all those folks that came forward today to, so that we could uh, uh, come against that thing that causes us to live lives of mediocrity and miss the full expression of his nature in our hearts. You know, so many, so many times it's because the pe- people, we have such an abundance of sensitivities and sensibilities given by God born to be creative like that, that the enemy wants to make sure that we never fulfill our purpose. So he wants to stop that creativity and we give the energy of our life surviving uh, rather, rather than flourishing. And, and the reason is, is because every time creativity occurs, God reveals another facet of his nature. And he is so outrageously uh, multidimensional and multi, hey y'all, I've got, got a bunch of these rampers over here done snuck in. Get, gonna have to get better ushers. Uh, <clears throat> uh, got Matt back and those guys from the ramper here. That's awesome to just know they're in the house. No wonder the melodies went to other places tonight. But every time creativity occurs, God reveals another facet of his nature. And so when we all bring our melodies into the room, uh, what we're doing is we're marrying truth and beauty. And when you marry truth and beauty, you awaken the wonder of God again. And it'll wind up being the greatest tool of evangelism that will ever be lived out in our generation. will be the overflow of our worship. Because the overflow of our worship, see, that's, that's why it was, it was such a battle there when uh, Jesus going through the temptations. And when ultimately when it all came to an end is when the enemy realized, wait a minute, he's not buying my manipulation, my preconceived ideas that might press him into his destiny even prematurely. You know, he could have done any one of those things that the enemy was proposing to him. And the powerful thing about that whole story was, is the Bible says it was, Jesus was tempted. And I looked up the word tempted, you know what it means? means he's tempted. (laughs) That means he had to consider everything that was proposed to him. Otherwise, it wouldn't be temptation. And, uh, but as he's going through that temptation, ultimately it, in the end, it turns out to be, oh, now the enemy is truly exposed to what he was all about. Because the, because the devil says, okay, I get it. I'm not going to be able to trip you up, manipulate you and stuff. Let, let me tell you, tell you, I've discovered I know who you are and I know what you came after. All of those thousands of years of covenant promise that was made by God is about to be lived out through you. And I know what you've come to do, but you're the one that's come to bruise my head. You're the one that has come to redeem the glory that was lost all the way back in the garden. I know who you are. And then, he, then basically this is what he says, and I'm paraphrasing. It's kind of down-home paraphrasing, but you get it. Then, then he says, I know what you came for. You came to redeem the glory. So why don't, why don't I just give it to you? 
That way you don't have to do the death, burial, resurrection, rejected of man thing. You don't have to suffer on the cross. You don't have to go through any of that. I know what you came for. You came to redeem that crown of glory. So well, I'll, t I'll just give it to you. No problem. I know who you are now. Uh, oh, oh, by the way, just one little thing. Just one thing, that's all. Just for a, just for a second. Just, just wor worship. Just for a, worship me just for a second. So now we found out that's what the whole deal was all about. It was about the worship. It was, a, it, it was about taking the song out of the heart of humanity because there stands the song of songs. Think about that. We're going to take the song out of the heart of humanity and humanity will never find what they were born to sing. They will never move in the full creative release of the presence of the glory of God in their life. They'll never experience that. They'll never experience the multifaceted, multidimensional throne room of heaven and bring it into the earth realm because this is a guy that's carrying it all in his blood, in his DNA. I mean, this is the guy that's standing there when they've, and they've discovered that the, the same properties that, that make up your blood is the same properties that make up light. The blood that's in his body will reveal all of heaven and the sound that is in heaven and the lights that are in heaven because sound and light, they cross the threshold at one point and become the same. Because you can play an A note on there and get 440 vibrations on your ear, but if you go up 700 octaves, it's no longer measured in hertz or meters or, 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 or frequency. Now it's measured in nanometers because it's become light. And there was standing the personification of light and glory and sound, and the sound of heaven was standing in their midst. And he was saying, he said, now listen, I know who you are. <laughs> I can't get you to sing in now. <laughs> it's all over. He knew that. The enemy knew. He had to trip him up and try to prematurely cause him to jump into his God-given destiny with the enemy's timing, and even the timing was critical, and that's one of the reasons timing is so important in music. Because when the first time the... the the, the heartbeat of man happened. It was when? Back in the garden, when man was created. But he wasn't created and spoken into existence like everything else was. It says that God reached down and grabbed a hold of the dirt, and Yatsar, he squeezed and formed and took, uh, formed it, and then he looked at it, and he didn't call it. He said, huh. He, the blast of his nostrils, the blast of the intention of God spoke to this form that was on the ground. And, 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 and he's, it's nafesh, huh, to expel as a shout. And we, we, he said, huh, the dirt went, huh. <laughs> but it didn't stop. It continued, huh, 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 huh. Rhythm was born in that very moment. When the heart came alive, rhythm was. And that's why men have been rhythmical, connected to time and eternity, every sense, and let everything that has who, 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 every song that'll ever come out of you is because, you know, God's good, ain't he? You know why he did that, don't you? Because he's awesome. And that's when he, when he awakened song. And every time creativity occurs, he reveals another facet of his nature. My, my, my. But then, the, then the Jesus kind of spoke up in the middle of it all there, and he said, you know, worship, is that what you're looking for? Well, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. That means if we're going to serve humanity, serve the kingdom, whatever we're going to do in this world, it, the only way that we, can, we, we will be able to keep from doing it out of our personal giftings and the energy of the flesh is if we do it as an overflow of worship. Does that make sense? See, uh, in, in other words, we don't have to serve humanity out of the energy of the flesh and suffer burnout. The overflow of our worship 
will then create environments where we're not doing sales jobs, we're releasing the sound of heaven when we worship. So every time that happens, what's happening is, is you, and, and you know what you're doing here corporately, you're, you're creating an atmosphere where truth and beauty can find one another and awaken wonder again. And uh, see, uh, I love the fact uh, how you bring your melody into the atmosphere. You, not these guys. They know what they're doing. But, and, and what's beautiful about that is you know what your part of that is. Because a lot of places you go, what happens is they are so skilled and, and anointed for what they do that they do your worshiping for you. But they're not up here to do your worshiping for you. See? What they're doing is they're up here creating the, that sound that they're creating. They're creating just enough water for you to walk on. But you have to walk on what they have put into the room. Otherwise, it is not the sound of many waters. It's the sound of a band with a bunch of great musicians and stomp boxes and, and uh, you know, all this stuff. And it sounds awesome, and, and, it, and it can even appease and appeal to the flesh and the emotional side and the soulish side and the rhythmical side and the harmony side and the melody side and all those things that can appeal unto your emotions and awake even an intellectual response. But music is a force that God put in the earth that bypasses the intellectual realm, goes straight to the spirit and says, now it's time to worship so we can engage in that realm and in this one. And that's where heaven kisses earth and y'all get caught in a smack. But they, but it's important for their, their skill and their anointing and their call and their destiny to all be lived out in this expressed creativity. And we better never try to dumb down what they're doing into some kind of canned thing to create a response in the church service. Reason we're going to be the generation that has revivals and outpourings and all that's because we're going to live our lives bigger than church atmospheres, and we're going to invade that realm and bring encounter into this realm. That's that's an that's an important thing we got to realize. When you stand up to sing, you, you, when you stand up to sing in this room, you're engaging, bringing your melody of worship into that, and that's what will break yokes of bondage off, even off of the region. I mean, I wish I had time to unpack that for you, but I'll just tell you, never discount or devalue your melody being heard in this room, your song being heard in this room. And that's not just a, a, a corporate leading worship uh, communication mechanism kind of thing. No, it has to be in the room. It has to be heard, your sound, your melody. <clears throat> and then, boy, I t you know, it's just so much I want to say tonight. And I, I, and I used, I used to remember everything, you know, whether it happened or not. But <clears throat> well, let, me just, let me just show you how, how important melody is. Can I do that for a second? For melody, for example. Here, 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 here. I'm, can, okay if I sing a little? Okay, here we go. How much is that doggy in the window? Ooh, the one with the waggedy tail. How much is that doggy in the window? I do hope that doggy's for sale. Now, that would, thank you very much for helping me out there. You know what that? You know what that means? That song means somebody gonna get a puppy. Is what that means. All right. Now li listen to this. How much is that dog in the window? You know what that song means? That dog going to die in that pen is what that, that means. Oh, yeah. That poor thing is starving to death. They won't, nope, they won't even give it any water. It's just sitting there in the window. The sun's cooking his little hide. Poor thing, don't nobody care. He'll never be able to chase a rabbit. He'll never lay down and let somebody do that. It's a life of suffering and he's going to die. Now, the reason I know the difference is just melody. That's all we changed was a melody. How much it, just the moving and the bending of a note that, that can carry it 
the tones and textures of an isolated heart that don't have the freedom to release their melody in the full expression of the joy and the passion and even sometimes the sadness. You know, sadness is a real emotion that we, most of the time, we don't know how to deal with and therefore depression has access to us because we cannot open up our real life and become vulnerable. Because hallelujah, praise God, thank you, Jesus, glory, glory G to Jesus, we got it all going on, you know. And so we want to create this pretense when the fact is, I, uh, there's a, old, uh, one, a great songwriter, uh, uh, one of the greatest songwriters in, of our generation was a dear friend of mine, I, and he was the happiest guy in the world, always happy. But when you would listen to his singing and listen to his songs, Man, he would write, you just want to go out and cut your wrist. <laughs> I mean, he would write the saddest songs you ever heard in your life. And everybody in the world cut his stuff. Everybody from, uh, you know, Willie Nelson to Elvis to, uh, you know, the line, 1,200 cover tunes this guy wrote, all right? All right. Just, but I'm telling you, some of the most gut-wrenching <laughs> songs the beauty and the depth of his poetry and the imagery was so mesmerizing you could not leave a melody that he would sing because it would go right to, and he just had that. And I said, I said, what in the world, man? What, but you're the happiest fella I know, but what's the deal? He said, I write my sadness so I don't have to live it. Think about that. He writes it the way he processes life was with his creative process was a way that he would rise above. Do you know that that's absolutely what David did? Look at the sadness in his songs. But yet I will praise the Lord my God who is worthy to be praised. And by the way, there are textures and tones of, and tempos that will, that will express that on, on ways that we don't even have the instruments for. So David would just use his creativity then to design instruments that would capture other frequencies in the sound spectrum that would be the full expression of the sound spectrum and light spectrum so that heaven could enter into the darkest song and the bending note and the pain of his life would actually be a way that he would welcome heaven and he made sure that he gave us the lyric so it could become our language and our reprieve, our release, our escape from the enemy as well. We just got to sing it. Even if you come into the house of the Lord on Sunday morning, don't be a hypocrite and try to act happy. Get in there and moan till the song comes alive in you. But don't let your melody be robbed. Don't, you know, we, we're going to have to get some authentic Christianity back in or the world out there is just going to keep scrutinizing and criticizing and so on and we don't have anything to say so we cocoon ourselves away in these polite Casio charismatic atmospheres that they will never darken the door of and we wonder why the world's not changing. We're carrying harvest in the depth of who we are. And, and it's for the church too. Now, you, uh, it's for the people of God. It's for the ones that stayed home, not just the prodigals. Remember when the prodigal came home, look what it says. When the prodigal made it back, well, religious knucklehead, he's out there pouting and carrying on. And what made him get to pouting and carried on is because he heard the sound of music and dancing in the Father's house. It was the sound of music and dancing in the Father's house. I wonder if that's the same sound that Adam heard when he was walking in the cool of the evening. Yeah. Because the same sound that he heard in the cool of the evening was that very same sound that Adam heard when he went, huh, huh, because that second word, he became a living, breathing soul. That second word is not nafash, naf, nafash. It is nafok, which means the sound of, the, of a panting, rhythmical, panting mother giving birth. When a mother's doing that, she's putting rhythm in the, the next generation that will find their melody and the uniqueness of the DNA is passed into their song. What are we going to birth in Huntsville, Alabama? What are we going to birth in Fayetteville? What's going to be birthed in Florence? What's going to be birthed in those other places? 
if we just become a new standard uh, of lawmakers and religious lawgivers to the culture, they're not interested. I don't know if you realize this or not, but lawgivers and lawmakers never shape culture. Lawgivers and lawmakers, what they do is respond or react to something negative in the culture, and then they cre create rules and regulation and rails to run on and restrictions to hold everybody in check because the culture's out of whack. Well, have you noticed something? The culture's getting more out of whack, and no matter what kind of rules and regulations we're creating, they're not buying it. Right? Lawgivers and lawmakers do not shape culture. Artists do. Songwriters do. Poets do. Why do poets and songwriters and musicians impact culture so much? Because they're the ones that are carrying melody and rhythm and tones and textures that can access the heart and access the spirit, bypass the intellectual reasoning again, not saying we're throw, becoming mindless. It's just that we're giving allegiance to what God has created us to do is to experience his presence and his glory and all of that light and sound that the enemy was trying to steal and didn't get away with because there was a redeemer that released the sound of the right relationship that humanity could rightly relate to the, to the throne room of heaven. Now, now, let's talk about this thing in just a minute. Who shapes culture? Artists, poets, songwriters, dancers, anyone who has access to touch the heart. Think about that. Storytellers, screenwriters, and so on. But the creatives are the ones that shape culture. Always have. Uh, uh, now, now uh, let's pretend a minute. If I was at home today in my mother's house having Sunday dinner, if I sit down in my mother's house having Sunday dinner, I can hear her now. I've heard it so many times. I sit down there to eat Sunday dinner, and I can hear Mama say, hey, 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 well, you, get your elbows off the table. And then I remember. And you know what I do? I get my elbows off the table. Because my mama's 85, but she'll hurt you. <laughs> oh, and she don't, she, she's not even slow about giving you a threat if you get out of line in her house. Put your elbows on the table, that is out of line. She just is liable to say, boy, I'll slap a knot on your head or Roberts can't take off. You get your elbows <laughs> off that thing. Oh, yeah, she'll threaten you in a minute. But she'll stand behind her threats, too. And she'll say, get them elbows off. And then she'll say, I don't care if you are uh, 42 years old. <laughs> well, it's that Kentucky math thing again. I don't you know, it, it is what it is, you know. No, I, I, no I'm, I'm a little older than that, I'll confess. All right. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I just turned 50 uh, about, uh, about 14, 15 years ago. Uh, <clears throat> but she'd say, get your elbow. Yeah, and you know what? I'll take my, But somewhere down the line, I, I asked, wait a minute, what is the big deal? What's the big deal? Why is it such a sin? Put your elbows on the table. And the reason it's such a sin is, is because when Da Vinci painted the Last Supper, the only person in the picture with their elbows on the table is Judas Iscariot, the betrayer of Jesus. Now you think about it. Da Vinci wasn't even there when it happened. <laughs> he was in a whole other thousand years away. <laughs> he wasn't there and that. He don't know what it looked like. All he knows is, is he interpreted or translated what he thought it must look like, used his creative process to create a picture that now became a knowing, a, an etiquette. It became a cultural nuance that became like a biblical idiom to us today. We know that it's wrong to put your elbows on the table. He ain't the only one that pulled that. But you see what I mean? Artists shape culture. And, and sooner or later, that piece of art has become a part of our traditional knowing of Scripture. And tradition is the one thing. Man's tradition can render the Word of God ineffective because we don't know what was really good. You see where I'm going with that? We don't know, like 1829 in upstate New York in the newspaper. A poet put a poem in a newspaper. It was the night before Christmas. And all through the house, not a creature stirring, not even a mouse. 
before this poem is over, the Christmas season has been redefined. Because now it's not about Emmanuel, God with us, baby in a manger. You know what? It, now it's also about a big fat guy that flies through the air with reindeer and a sleigh, goes down the chimney and got one of them with a nose that does this, you know. And I'm not an anti-Santa Claus guy, y'all. I, 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 he, he, he got me a guitar one time. I preached, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> and uh, I, I love him I, I, and I appreciate it. Uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, but, but, but the fact is, look at there, whole new, whole new uh, economic systems are set in place in the earth. Whole new understandings of a season that were given to honor, you know, God with us. Uh, but now it's, it's sidetracked a bit and has this element of entertainment and distraction that robs us from because a poet shapes culture. You know, there would be no William Wallace if it hadn't been for a guy named Blind Harry that wrote a poem, 1,200-line poem about William Wallace, uh, and, and it was lost for, uh, for hundreds of years. And, uh, and so William Wallace, Braveheart and all that was a completely lost, lost to their, uh, basically lost to their history. But, but then they find this poem that tells the story. And then they begin to search and seek and dig and carry on. And of course, Hollywood gets a hold of it and uh, there's a whole, uh, uh, you know, all right. But, 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 uh, but look how we shape culture. What if, and David did this. See, that's what David did. And this, if you start looking back through history, you'll find out that all the great revivals were just, basically born out of the Holy Spirit breathing on some insignificant somebody sitting lost in the hills of obscurity somewhere. And all of a sudden, there would be a touch of God. They would encounter God. Then they would begin to carry encounter and the whole world would change because God, if it, see, one of the definitions of creativity is the ability to access options. God's never run out of options. He can do whatever's necessary. He'll find some little shepherd boy. He'll find some little somebody on, in the hills of Wales down in a dark mine and awaken the truth in them that carries a nation shaking realization of who God is in that generation. He'll find somebody in, in Oak Bowery, Alabama born in 1847 shake their life and shape, then shape their life into something that will reveal and reflect his glory. He'll find some kid that just wouldn't, he just refused to not preach because he had the fire of God in his life. And, uh, and somehow or another, he'll jolt humanity and out of their creativity and, their, and also their song, their sound, the thing that they come most alive to, God says, I'll use that. Because see, here, here's the thing, guys, we got to learn, we got to know, and this next generation's getting it better than anybody I've ever seen. They're getting this. It's coming alive in them. It just ain't about building ministry. It's about how do we give our life away. That's what this thing's about. And there's a bunch of them willing to give their life away. And, the, and the, there's a, co a, a collective call, a collective yearning that's becoming the sound and the song of a generation. And God honor it. See, in the Old Testament alone, there were nine times, there were nine different times that God's people would turn their eyes away from God, go whoring after other gods, and idolatry would come in. When idolatry comes, and the way that would work in the, in the Word of God, those nine times that I'm talking about, what, the way that worked was is the enemy, whether they be Philistines or Moabites or whatever they are, all these ites would encamp against the people of God. They didn't inv invade or attack. They would encamp against them. What does encamp against mean? That means there would be a dark, idolatrous culture that would begin to encamp against the people of God. Then the people of God would cocoon themselves in while they're down there building their structures and building their educational systems and building this false theology, false theology into the culture. Didn't attack, but just only just enough to make sure that God's people knew that they're going to have to cocoon, cocoon themselves in for protection. And, join, and then uh, lock arms in a negative unity of, against our enemy. 
But we're not going against the enemy. They're just encamping against us. Pretty soon, we begin to compromise. And the, when, when compromise comes, pretty soon, worship is diminished and devalued because the idols start invading and infiltrating. And pretty soon, that compromise of truth and beauty has broken the wonder of who God is and what God can do. And then out of that compromise, we pretty soon find out we're, we're in trouble. And then what would happen? God would find some kid picking a harp in a sheep field. Or God would find some guy laying on top of a hill, moaning and whining the blues. Can't take Jericho. And he'd have an encounter. He'd look up, and there stands a soldier in full battle attire, arms glistening in the sun. He's a warrior. And this Joshua, when he saw that, he, said, he was startled. He said, well, you know, you ever notice some Joshua's and Elijah's and people like that? When they get depressed and despondent like that, they were always given to uh, exaggeration. Like, uh, you know, here, here you got prophets that call fire down from heaven, but they're all, I just I wish I just, uh, could just die. I, I just pray I'd have never lived. I just, you know, because Jezebel was out to kill him. Oh, I'd curse the day that I was born. It's exaggeration. He don't want to die. If he want to die, I'll go over to Jezebel's house. She's wanting to kill you anyway, you fool. <laughs> Bunch of knuckleheads. Why don't we get real with this every now and then? Go over there. She's waiting for you. Got a big club and an ugly husband standing. He's wanting to watch. <laughs> what in the world? He, was, he didn't want to. He, he, was just want, he was just a pity party. And if the enemy can keep us living in that little cocoon p- pity party, there's Joshua. He's laying there with one of those. And he looks up. And he has this startling realization. It's actually what theologians would call a theophany. Here is the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus himself standing there ready to go to war. And, 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 and remember what Joshua said? Now, uh, uh, are you on their side or are you on my side? And the soldier said, No. That is the answer to the question. It is, that's the way he answers it. He said, no, you are on my side. I am the captain of the hosts of the armies of the Lord. All of the illuminaries of heaven will move at the command of the sound of my voice. And then watch what happens. Joshua kicks off his shoes and worship is restored. And now out of worship comes a strategy. Right? Look at, look at, look at old Gideon. Out, not until worship was restored, then comes the strategy. And the strategies never make sense to the natural mind. It's okay, they ain't supposed to. How are we going to, how are we going to take Florence? How are we going to take Huntsville? How are we going to take those high places in the heart of humanity out there that are bound and broken and held captive by the darkness of this world? How are we going to get... The overflow of our worship will create atmospheres of deliverance because the songs of deliverance ain't just about us. It's about those that really need the deliverance as well. But you notice, out of the worship then comes these crazy strategies. Go down there and take a lap and so on. uh, I mean, that don't make sense, does it? You're going to take Jericho? You can moan and whine if you want to, but once worship happens, no more moaning and whining. And now... He has to go back and tell all the soldiers, all these warriors. He says, guys, I've heard from God. Oh, yeah? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to take, well, we're going, what are y'all doing this week? Uh, Tell you what, let's do. We're going to go down there, and every day we're just going to walk around in a circle, and on the seventh day, we're going to holler at them. That'll straighten them out. <laughs> all right. Don't, don't you know all those soldiers will say, oh, now where do we sign up for this? <laughs> you know, seven days, seven trumpets, seven shouts, seven, 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 seven was put out there. And you, what's your job? Just don't say anything. 
Keep your mouth shut. Walk in the silence. Cause all of your personal strengths and giftings and everything to be yielded to the possibilities of God doing something outside of your gifting and your call and your anointing. What we're going to do is we're going to walk out a strategy of obedience beyond anything that we can get our head around. That's what it's about. And that's how all revivals just, and then you look, and, 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 that's, and that's part of the dilemma as people try to study and understand revivals and outpourings and stuff. And, and let, let me talk about that a little bit, okay? Here's the way it works. Now, God's people, after the compromise and all that stuff, nine times in the Old Testament, one of these obscure, insignificant people rise up out of the desert of insignificance into the destiny they were created for, and they would always fight the battles with a sound or a song or a praise. Send the singers first. Send the dancers first. Send the shouters first. Go out and raise our hands. Yada out first. But there was always a strategy that was born out of worship and praise, enthroning him in the midst of his people again. And most of the time, he would go to war on their behalf, and all of the enemies would just be thrown into total calamity and conflict and confusion and just whoop the hide off of each other. And the people of God are standing there with the victory of God being demonstrated in such a way that only God could have done it. Therefore, only God will be glorified. Now, that's awesome. Nine times it happened in the Old Testament. And, and, uh, uh, and the first thing is worship would be restored. And, and I dare say the purposes for sound being restored. The musicology being understood and taught from David's day forward, they were carrying truths that gave them access to the power of the presence of God. And if we looked at the book of Psalms in a very different way than we do now, rather than just a little contemplative kind of a thing, and started finding the, the depth of the ammunition that has been placed there waiting to, be the, the, to uncap that kind of power. But now, now down through the ages you find, that when the, even in modern history, when the world would just really get in a mess, then God would send revival because there would be a remnant somewhere that would turn their eyes to God. Now, most all revivals, I don't know if you've realized it's not. If you study revival, you'll find out that most all revivals lasted about 18 months to three years at the most. That's all. And, and many of them even less than that, like the Welsh revival. The, 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 every revival has happened anywhere in the earth since 1904 can be tracked back to that revival that lasted nine months. You can chronologically follow any revival that's happened anywhere in the world back to, that, back to that revival. Now, uh, what was I saying about that? <laughs> revival. Do what? Yeah, there'll be a remnant. And like in Wales, there was, that, there was a remnant. But even prior to that, there'd be, be remnants that, would, that would, would carry a whole new realization. Oh, I was, here's what I said. Most all of them last such a short time. Why do, why do revival stop always? Revival typically stops because man turns their eyes to righteous living and takes their eyes off of what the Holy Spirit's doing. However we define righteousness becomes what we hold on to. So our definition and our theology and our understanding of what righteousness is, this is my definition of righteousness, and it sure don't include fellers with whiskers on their face like you've got there, buddy. <laughs> See, you, you hear me? So get that, get that fuzz off your face, and we're going to become part of the kingdom of God here. We're going, in other words, we're all going to become alike. And we'll all have the same rules and the same regulations and the same, same, same. And now it's not unity, it's sameness. And now we've turned our eyes to righteous living, take our eyes off of what the Holy Spirit's doing. And the Holy Spirit says, well, hey, if y'all got this, go ahead. I'm out of here. When you get desperate again and your culture completely collapses around you 
and when, and when your histories start becoming rewritten so no one can tell the stories and remember his mighty acts and tell of his wondrous works, and even your language is being challenged, you better know for sure that there is a breach in the gate, and in, in, in through that gate come those that are, have encamped against the worship that's in your heart. That's what happens over and over and over and over and over and over. So, and here's the way it works. Revival comes, mighty, wonderful things happen, revival comes. That's beautiful. Uh, let, me, let me say something else about revival. Let me, let me give you this right here. To, I see some of you taking notes. So if you don't mind, I'll just, I want to just teach just a minute. Revival history, uh, first of all, if you've never seen a revival, it's unimaginable. And if you have, it's indescribable. And it's supposed to be that way. But here's the problem. No one teaches revival history. We don't tell the stories. You'll hear somebody in a sermon say, you know, what was what Smith Wigglesworth one time? Powerful little illustration, two minutes long, where he slung somebody under the wall or kicked the baby out across the platform or something. <laughs> and which is, wow, that's awesome. You know, you know, uh, somebody did and he'll just beat, beat him into life, I reckon, you know. I mean, that's what plumbers do, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> okay? So we know just about, enough about Smith Wigglesworth to feel the wow factor in the faith of this man, but we don't know him. And we don't know his story. And we don't know the price he paid. We don't know how his heart would have had to bend so many times around the very calling that was on his life that he couldn't understand. He just wanted to be a plumber. What in the world? But out of that obscurity comes one that's carrying something that is so powerfully creative that God reveals facets of his nature that nobody knew about. Whoa. And then he disappears off into the. Now, that, that's kind of the way we grasp revival history. Because again, nobody teaches revival history. Methodists, Methodists teach Methodist history. Baptists teach Baptist history. Presbyterians preach, and so on. You get it. But what a. Why have we lost so much? Now, we don't know revival history. One of the reasons is no institutions teach it. Number two, writers and historians that chronicle it weren't there. After the revival's over, these writers and historians come along and define it through their grid, and they weren't there, and they didn't experience the fingers growing back and the hands growing back and the arm growing back. I mean, so you, you, they leave, leave it out because we don't know how to, to speak to that. Evangelicals write most all of the books on revival history, and so they write the miracles out because they're beyond the grid of their theological understanding. I mean, who, who knows how to tell the story about the, uh, July of 1914 when young Stephen a boy that got saved in the Welsh Revival down in the coal mines, not even in the church. He walked in the coal mines that day. The Welsh Revival is burning. The flames are burning across Wales. Young Stephen goes to work that day, walks in the mine, and hears 3,000 men singing, Here is love, vast as an ocean. When that song grabbed a hold of his spirit, he came alive to the song that was waiting to be an answer to his own life. He walks out of there saved. And he heads home. And on his way home, he gets on a street corner there and starts telling one of his buddies, you know, I went in there today when they were singing this song, something just happened in me. And while he's telling that story, three or four other guys walk up, and then four or five more. In a minute, he's telling about 12 or 15 guys what had happened to him. He'd just gotten saved a few hours ago. And all he knows is, and he's trying to find the words, and, he's t and, and he is. In a few minutes, there's 20 people. In a little while, there's 50. Now there's about 75 people, and he's standing there trying to tell all of them what Jesus had done to him when he heard that song. Yes. Yes. And the old woman that lived on the corner in this little village called Mastag, and the old woman looks out there and thinks, is this a fight or is this a riot? What's going on out there? Yes. And she goes walking out there and walks up behind him. She's just one of those old gals, you know, and walks up behind him and, Here's what he's saying. But by now, see the shift change. There's, there's over 100 people. And, and he, she hears what he's saying, and she, she don't say a word. 
She just turns around, goes back in the house. In a minute, the door opens, and this old woman is carrying a straight back chair coming out there like that and stands that chair down and pulls his sleeve and points to the chair, and he says, thank you. And he stands up on that chair, and by now, he's been talking for an hour and a half and because the crowd keeps getting bigger, and he's telling everybody what Jesus had done in his life. Well, now it's getting dark, and the old woman, don't say a word. She just walks back in the house and comes walking out with an old coal oil lantern. Come on now. We call it coal oil in Kentucky. You might call it kerosene or something. Uh, can't, ain't my fault you're misinformed. But <laughs> she's standing there with this old coal oil lantern. And, and, and here, guys, the moral of this story is great revivals don't come when great men preach great sermons. Great revivals come when old women carry lanterns shining them on the next generation, giving them a place to stand. Let their voice be heard. Let their faces be known. That's where revival comes from. The only thing we're missing is those who know how to, to step up and let their voice be heard because we've, we, we've so much of the time, we're not giving our life away. We're building ministries that are fashioning the next generation in our own image and trying to impose our ideas into them. When the fact is, there's a bunch of stuff that we don't know about what God's gonna do just because we know what God did. You hear me? We need to walk in enough of a humility and enough of, of an honor of this unusual thing that God wants to do on a, on a new generation and give them a place to stand. Are they gonna mess it up? I hope so, but I, and I wanna tell you something. I hope that you, that next generation will quit trying to learn from our failures. Learn from your own failures. Go ahead and yo, go ahead and mess up, We're, right? Why can't we create atmospheres of mercy and kindness and tenderness where they feel free to go for it? Go for it. And, uh, and if you mess up, you know what we're going to do? We're still going to applaud you. Because what fathers and mentors do is create atmospheres that don't tell them what to do, but they create atmospheres that where there's so much love, they have the freedom to do exactly what they were created to do. And if it tears up, they know they don't have to run to a pig pen somewhere to find their voice. Okay? Now, that, but see, out of revival, can I tell you all a little more about him real quick? Stephen goes to, and now he, God starts using him and he becomes a pastor. And now he's a pastor in a village called Chanechli. Chanechli, that's L-L-A-N-E-L-L-I. Right. But if you say L-L, it's got to put your air under your tongue in Wales. Chanechli. And in this village, Chanechli. <laughs> I've been to Wales 32 times. And I'm still trying to just read what hello means over there. They'll have 71 consonants. They don't need vowels when you've got 71 consonants in one word. <laughs> but in, in this little village called Klinekli, now, now Stephen, is a, he's, been a, he's a pastor. And he's standing in this little chapel one Sunday, on a Sunday night, and he's just preaching away, and he's just waxing eloquent, you know. And while he's preaching the word of God, he notices that his congregation really don't care. Because he's just pre preaching away, and it's, he's, think, he's feeling frustrated, a little tension, because they're not even looking at him. They won't, they're not even paying any attention to him. It's sort of a B-flat kind of message, you know. And, <laughs> and while he's trying to speak this message, they're just look. And finally, he just gets frustrated. He closes his Bible, yeah. and he go like that, and he jumps. He jolts because he sees... There on the wall okay. is the Lamb of God, 3D, fully animated, on the wall, making eye contact with every person in the room. And until, and now listen, there's no projectors, no, lan, no let's call all lanterns in the window. Right. See, there's no sound systems, there's none of that. And, 
he, and then Mo, when he does like that, that's the first time that the people in the congregation realized that they were not the only one person having this mystical experience. Every person there was seeing it. And now he saw it. And he j jolted. And when he did that, everybody's going out back doors, front doors, windows. They're crawling <laughs> under pews. They're, nobody. You can imagine how explosive that was in that moment. They're gone, checking out of here. He thinks, well, I'll probably never get this bunch back, right? <laughs> no, within 10 minutes, they were all back, and they brought their cousins and their brothers and their sisters and their dogs. They, uh, they felt that, and for four and a half hours, this image, every person there was having an encounter. Four and a half hours later, now this is all written, documented truth. Four and a half hours later, that image that had been making eye contact with everybody, I hate to use this word, but here it is, morphed into the man of sorrows making eye contact with every person in the room. Nobody knew what to do with that. And so the next week, young Stephen comes back and he wants to try to bring some kind of balance, some kind of theology, some kind of understanding. He don't want to appeal to the superstitious thing, charismatic superstition or any of that. He wants to try to bring biblical foundation for what's happening there. And he feels like the, you know, being a Welsh and having that, 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 those mystic sensibilities anyway, prophetic sensibilities, in, it's in the land, it's in the water there. Yeah. And uh, because of the old Celtic knowings that go back for so long, far. But now he comes back and he's going to try to bring some understanding to this. And he, the only thing he felt like the Lord had given him was the man of sorrows was already beginning to know that something was coming against the earth and it was going to bring great, great sorrow to humanity. And a number of days later, World War I breaks out. And most of the, all the young men that were in that village didn't come home. And But with that, now let me back up. With that, He's going to bring understanding. And when he, and, but in the meantime, come into the service that night, a little blonde haired girl about five years old that didn't have any eyes. She only had raisins in the sockets, a little dried up like raisins. That little girl came in that night blind and she walked out of the service with two big old baby blue eyes. And her grandchildren still have the pictures and the stories within their family. And they tell their children and their children's children's children. And they remember the mighty acts of God and what happened in grandma's life. And how she grew up to be that miracle girl with the big blue eyes. The big blue eyes that, that just reflected the beauty of heaven. Awesome. Why don't we get to hear and tell those stories? You know? And, and of course... You know, he and his brother had these incredible giftings. His brother, George, wound up being on call to the royal family in England, known to have raised three of them off their deathbeds. What, what happened? Where they, oh, the following week then, they brought a young man in, 15 years old. One leg was normal. One leg had not grown since birth. And they bring him into the service, and he leaves walking on two legs. Guys, hear me. And, you know, the room was full of spectators, you know. And some of those spectators that were sitting there and saw this left there and became missionaries to India and China for the next 40 years. And that's one of the, one of the ways that the Welsh Revival began to just carry truth into the nations. And, and of course, these, now let, let me make the long story short. It wasn't long after that that because of all the signs and wonders and miracles on these two brothers... Uh, they wind up, for example, in a place right outside of Liverpool in a place called the Boodle. And the Boodle, they, they, had, they would fill boxing arenas. And these guys would move in signs and wonders and miracles. Boxing arenas. They're preaching from the boxing ring. And they would have to carry away the crutches and the wheelchairs and the prosthetic limbs on train cars out of the meetings, folks. What in the world? How does this get written out of history? We need to be telling the stories of revival. Yes. Yes. Those are, those, uh, the, you know, if you're going to aspire to be something, don't aspire to be the next counting crows in church. 
right? And, I, and I'm not being mean or critical. I'm saying here we are trying to emulate the emulators and imitate the imitators until we become imposters and we're not carrying the miracle signs and wonders and releases of God's glory. And I don't think it's something that we can necessarily do on our own, but I'll tell you what, if we begin to remember the mighty acts of God, tell of his wondrous works, if it becomes our language, it becomes our lyric, and if it's our lyric, it's our song, and God will not resist the song that's carrying a revelation of truth and it's carrying a release of his creativity. It won't happen. Well, let me show you how it works, though. So here's how revival works. You have a revival. Oh, oh let, me, let me share this with you. There's a gentleness in those that long for revival that you seldom find in those that want revival. You hear me? There's a gentleness in those that long. It's not about powerful personalities. It's about a powerful presence of God. But the time has come now to stop our longing for revival. The time has come now to prepare for the harvest. With a gentleness of mind and a quietness of heart, it won't necessarily always be about the fire of God. It might just be about the love of the Father. Because revival doesn't just come when the top blows off. Revival comes when the bottom drops out. And the bottom is dropping out of a lot of stuff in our generation. But there's a God who is more than able to raise it up, lift it up. And he is and will. Here's the way it's worked. Generations past, 18 months, revival's over, okay? Over here, now God's Holy Spirit is drawn away. Getting a desperate situation again culturally. Now, something else. God in his faithfulness will do something else. But this is not revival. That was revival. This is not revival. That was revival. This is renewal. Now, what happened is, is we begin to look back and curse because they're so full of what God said, they can't hear what God is saying. And these folks over here are saying, well, if we don't initiate it, we don't appreciate it. And now there's a breach broken that was supposed to be carrying and sustaining the covenant purposes of God like a melody and like a rhythm and like a, like a song of the Lord moving from generation to generation, awakening so that there don't have to be this other dynamic to where we have to build again. Revival. No, that's revival. This is renewal. And then once renewal is over, what happens? Well, that was renewal and that's revival. Let me tell you what God's doing. This is an outpouring. <clears throat> See what I mean? And you know, like, like for, for example, and, and here's, the way, and here's, here's, here's the way it works. Like for example, Azusa Street revival happens. And you know what? R.A. Torrey and G. Campbell Morgan, some of the great theologians and respected men of God, men of the word. When they looked at Azusa Street, you know what they said? There it is, the last vomit of Satan. Because they didn't have a, have a, a place for it. They didn't have a grid in their head. If God were going to do something like that, he would have used us. Are you hearing me? So revival, there's revival. Here's renewal. There's an outpouring. And then when the outpouring's over, what are we going to do? Well, it's, now it's an awakening, and it's over here. And once that awakening is over, Oh, we have a movement. And after the movement is over, over here, no, you know what we're having is a visitation. How many, how many times and how many ways are we going to create new marketable terminology that tries to define what God's doing? And there is a multi-generational eternal God that's waiting for the song to be awakened in our DNA so the next generation will carry the song and carry the song and carry the song and carry the song. Revival and renewals and outpourings and awakening, movements, visitation. I believe we're not going to have any more of them. I think it's harvest time. And it's not a new box to put it in. It might even look like some of the others, which were called revolutions and renaissance and reformations. And I'm, I'll just say it like this. I'm going to start closing now because it takes me about an hour and a half to close. I'm going to get at it. <laughs> <clears throat> it's a time for the gifted, creative thinkers to stop thinking and go ahead and do the unthinkable. 
when you look at people like Stephen and those who carried the word and carried the supernatural in their day, what, ha what happened to those kind of guys? What, where'd they go? That's not that long ago. Now, it's not hard to go back into the days of the old Celtic saints and the mystics and stuff and find those that carried the same kind of a grace on them that Jesus gave to the church to do even greater things. But then somewhere along the line through reformations and all this kind of stuff, we started trying to insist on theological correctness. And sometimes it got sideways because somebody's going to win the argument. And, you know, if, if there's going to be an argument, somebody's going to be right, somebody's going to be wrong. So I think I'll be right and let y'all be wrong. And that kind of a mindset would, would join. But then there was always those things that were outside the parameters of our theological understanding that we had the ability to criticize. I'll, I'll just say it like this. I, th I think if the church is not being accused of sorcery, we're not carrying the kingdom. I want you to think about it. If they don't have enough ground to stand on to accuse us of doing something that is beyond the grids of our understanding, something is missing. And I'll tell you what, if any church in America closes its doors, the community ought to weep. But when a church closes its doors, you don't hear the culture weeping. We need to be those that are such a demonstration of the kingdom of God that something is missing when the people of God close their doors. For whatever reason those doors would close, something is missing in our world. And, and, and they're not even seeing or knowing. Let, 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 me, let me end with this. What happened with Stephen? He went on to carry that kind of a truth. And the Pentecostal movement all, all over England was born out of, out of what these guys were carrying, these two brothers. And, um, and how did it end for him? Well, you find Stephen having been betrayed and abandoned by his the own brothers in the, in the denomination that he was the father of. Yes. You find him sitting in a straight back chair in a room when he died when he died, it was on the third page of the newspaper, a little thing about that big and nobody even noticed. All the last years of his life, he was sitting in a room with rheumatoid arthritis, so racked with pain that he would sit in the chair and if you come to visit him, you'd have to sit on the floor so he could see you. Sitting beside of his blind daughter, people would come from all over the world and they would take his hand and touch whoever had come and they would go away miraculously healed. And you know what I got to say about that? I don't know and you don't either. We don't know everything. We could say that, oh, I know, you know, and we come up with some harebrained idea, oh, there was sin in his pastor's life, in his covering. You would come up with some kind of answer to appease something in us. I don't know and you don't either. Are we ready to say we don't know? Are we ready to meet the world and say, I don't, I don't know, but God? You know, it's not a debate. It's not an argument. It's not about winning the argument. It's about releasing the love and the goodness and the power and the presence of God. I remember years ago when I was pastoring, uh, in Nashville, Tennessee, 84% of our church were uh, musicians, singers, songwriters, session players, household words. 84% of our church, some of them, some of them had, I, I remember pulling all of them together, one, a bunch of them together, and I said, listen, guys, and, and some of these had like 17 Grammys and this kind of stuff. It's kind of, I've never even talked about this like this, but it's kind of a heady thing when you're standing there, uh, you know, and, and uh, all these music business, household words are sitting everywhere. You know, I mean, it's, it's kind of hard to preach with Johnny Cash sitting on the front row. You know, I'll just tell you. I baptized John's son, John Carter. And, and, in, the, and, and in those days, and, and because it always feels like a name-dropping thing, you know, and I don't get, 
you know, and I don't want it to be, it's not what I'm talking about here. Um, you know, uh, Elvis always told me, never be a name dropper. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, if you told me once, you told me a thousand times, you know. Uh, <laughs> but, but you know, you know what I'm saying. God, God, I, I, I'm only telling you this for the sake of this story. I want you to hear this story, all right? And, and, and plus, I'm getting too old to care about a lot of stuff anyway, so I'll just talk. But here, here uh, it all, that's kind of a heady atmosphere, you know. And, uh, and I pulled everybody together one day. I said, you know what? All of our kids are realizing that growing up in the homes and the families that you're growing up in, most of our kids are thinking that music has to do with record deals and contracts and buses and tours and, and fan clubs and all this kind of stuff. Why don't we show them another side of what music is about? Why don't we take everybody and we're going to go out and there's a place called Red River up in Kentucky and we're going to go to the Red River Meeting House and about what happened in, in 1799 and 1800s was so, uh, so amazing and our kids are never going to know these stories if we don't pass that on, if we don't keep, the, keep that alive. It's being lost. And so here's what, and here's what they would do. See, what happened in the late 1790s, there was a fellow, it was a place called Rogues Harbor. Did I ever tell you about it? Rogues Harbor is a place, nobody lived in Rogues Harbor, Kentucky. It was a Kentucky frontier, western frontier at that time. Nobody lived there but hillbillies, outlaws, whiskey runners, and hellions. Just a rowdy bunch. My, some of my relatives, they, they're the ones that li <laughs> lived out there. And, and this little old nowhere in the middle of nowhere kind of place in the frontier. Until, and, then, and they had three little old churches, Gasper River, Mud River, and Red River Church. Little old log churches, but they couldn't build a church. They couldn't really do anything for the kingdom there because the rowdies would run them off. They'd beat the preachers up, they'd, you know, and they'd burn churches and all this kind of stuff. Couldn't get, couldn't get anything started there until one day an old Scottish Presbyterian preacher named James McGreedy showed up on a wore out horse and when he rode in, he stepped off that horse and beat the dust out of his hat, put his hat back on, said, I won't be leaving. I'm going to be praying until God moves in this place. And he had one of those big old everybody pray kind of voices. And they said you could hear him for miles out across some hills and holler. And he would stand there in the, in the beauty of what's called the barons, the, or burrens. It's named after the burrens over, over in Ireland, in Scotland. But he, he would stand there in the, in the barrens and he'd preach the word of God and he wasn't going to leave. And they, what he'd do, he'd preach a while and then he'd fight a while. He'd preach a while and fight a while. But he ain't leaving. I think that's maybe where the Baptist denomination was born up there. I don't know. But, you know, uh, I hope y'all don't take that personal. Uh, but I, I used to live in Nashville where you are either Baptist or you're getting ready to move. You know what I'm saying? So... <clears throat> But I'd preach a while and he'd fight a while. He didn't leave. And sure enough, then came the day. Called a, he had enough people now that were praying. He said, we're going to have a communion service. He brought all of them together in a communion service. Now, communion then was not like what we do now. We call communion, you know, the wafers and the wine. That's the Lord's Supper. But in the old Scottish Presbyterian mind, that, that was the Lord's Supper. But communion was common union where we all come together. I was just in the, in the Hebrides of Scotland where they still do it this way. Common union means everyone comes together and out of the common union of togetherness, we prepare our hearts for three days and on the third day, we receive the Lord's Supper. Still that way till this day. And, uh, and, and, and there in the Hebrides on the, Isle, on the Isle of Lewis is where the Hebrides revival happened, where all the miracles and that, uh, signs and wonders, and I mean, you know, a ship sitting in the middle of the moors with light all around it, and they knew it was the gospel ship and a whole island. There'll be hundreds of people laying in ditches crying out to the Lord. I just got to meet with and sit down and talk with all the old, they call them the old worthies that are still alive on the Isle of Lewis. They were there. And to hear them tell the story in their 80s, they'll start telling you the stories and you realize when you look in their eyes, they never left the revival and the revival never left them. The glory is as powerful and alive in them today as it was in the 40s. And uh, uh, I wish I could tell you now our stories about that. But, there, there, but here we are, Rogues Harbor, Kentucky, and they're getting ready to have communion. Well, God began to move 
in their midst. And out of that, a few months later, then came the Cane Ridge Revival. So you had the Red River and the Cane Ridge Revival, which was the cradle for the Second Great Awakening. It was the birthplace of the Second Great Awakening. And um, so I'm, anyway, 20 years ago, it was whatever it was, 25 years ago when I was pastoring, I said, we're going to go out there and we're going to reenact those meetings. And the way that, like, like they did at Cane Ridge, what they would happen is they looked up and they, they, they were startled that 25 to 30,000 people showed up in the middle of a field in Kentucky. That's half the population of Kentucky or more. But the news went out that God was moving and they're showing up at these meetings and no PA system, 30,000 people, what are you going to do? So they would just cut out a big old tree, a stump, and they'd throw these old mountain preachers up there and they would preach. And there'd be 15 or 20 of them preaching at one time. And the way that works is if you can hear me, I'm your preacher. <laughs> All right? And so there'd be some old mountain, uh, Scott, uh, you know, some old Irishman over here preaching and uh, and over there's a Scotsman preaching, and over there, and they're all just preaching. And they said when they'd wear out, they'd drag them off and throw another one up there, 24-7, <laughs> preaching the word of God. And, and the singing, the sound of the song was incredible. Because imagine that. You had all these song leaders. If you can hear me, I'm your song leader. No hymn books, and they did it all with what was called line singing. Like, you know, soul fish, shape note, sacred heart, soul fish kind of singing. And so, when, when I would, in other words, they would pitch it and, uh, and call it. So, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That's the way they would do it. Right. Out of that old Highland sound, right? And they would say, amazing grace, how sweet. That saved wretch like me. It saved wretch like And over here they're singing, blessed assurance. Jesus. And over there they're singing, at the cross, at the cross. You got 15 songs going all at the same time. And they said when the praise would go up, it would be as the sound of a mighty Niagara had found its way into the, in, in, into the hills and the hollers there. Imagine what that would have been like. And in the meantime, people are falling under the power of God. There's people falling and being slain in the spirit. And, it also, and this whole thing started because in this communion gathering, the, McGee, the two McGee brothers, one Methodist, one Presbyterian, they rode in there in the same buggy, Methodist and Presbyterian. That's a big deal. But, and Barton Stone and all those guys, the, the big shots, and James McGreedy, they'd already closed the surface, service, and they were leaving. And they're on the buggy going out. And there was an old woman over in the corner, some old grandma, some old Kentucky gal. She says, whoo, she gives a big old shout. And when she does, the whole room began to tremble. McGee brothers fell to the floor just like they'd been shot with a deer rifle or something. They just fall to the floor and God visited in such a powerful way that, that the women, one of them, and, and you know, of course, everybody, the critics, they would say, wow, they're over there barking like dogs and tree and the devil and all this. And God, remember, they're going to these tremble things, these shake. But in those days, that shaking thing was not those that were submitting to the Holy Spirit. They were the ones that were resisting the Holy Spirit. And God was shaking their world and jolting them in some powerful, unique little point right there. Do you hear that? Now, and what was happening is, is a sound had been released that first night because when the Holy Spirit hit the thing, there was a, there was a the women would uh, sling their hair and it would crack like a whip. Now imagine that. You got long hair. Just imagine slinging your hair like a whip. Now, first of all, what you know how a whip works. You know, a whip's a big long piece of leather with a popper on the end of it, and you sling that thing like that, and that popper on the end you know, smacks the leather, and it. That's not what happens. Here's what happens. What happens is that piece on the end is going that direction and changes directions faster and breaks the sound barrier and goes the other direction. It turns around. So it creates an explosion in the atmosphere born out of the sound changing its direction and creating this explosion. That's the quick, that's the quick version. So every time you crack a whip, well, now you got a women. In Danville, Kentucky, there was one of the, I won't say what denomination, well, why not? But anyway, 
that, you know, how, how people could criticize those kind of things, right? And so he stands up in the pulpit on a Sunday morning, says, I'll tell you what, they're over there barking like dogs and treeing the devil and are cracking their... And when he did that, he slung his head and he broke his neck and died in the pulpit. Now, why don't we see that on, in, on, in the newspaper today? You know what I'm saying? But that was the kind of outpouring that began to shape America and God was shaking America and setting things in order. For then what would not be an awakening or whatever coming past it, then at least people like D.L. Moody and Ira Sankey and Sam Jones and all these women, thousands. Sam Jones led a million souls to Jesus and today nobody even knows who he is. D.L. Moody, a million and a half souls came into the kingdom under, under the ministry of D.L. Moody and Ira Sankey. We don't even know who they are because it wasn't during days of revival. What? No, it was just evangelists doing what evangelists do and doing it right. And shaping culture with song and giving lyric to a, to a, to a generation. Now, so anyway, what I was telling you was, I said, I want our young people to understand something about music other than what we're understanding. Because in 1922, everything changed in America and America lost their song. Did you know that? In the 20s, that's when we lost our song. Because the radio was invented, a technology now enabled us to go by singing. And we go by the song, we buy the records of the ones that are singing our song. I should have wrote that song. Boy, I should have wrote that. If I had written that, you know. In other words, they're singing our song and it created a commercial dynamic that causes us to buy the expression and lose our song and give it away to the professionals. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so we get a baggy, uh, a, 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 what's that called? Baggy. Doggy bag of emotion is what's happening there. No, we're going to find our song. And so we go and we have a meeting. It was powerful. And we had all the teenagers, you're the preachers. Every one of you get 10 minutes to preach the word of God. And all of these country music folks, they are the choir. And we'd sing these old songs and then another one would preach and another one would preach. We did it right on the ground where it took place and it was awesome. 20 years later, I get a phone call, 25 years later, just two, three years ago, three years ago, got this phone call. One of the young men that was one of those preachers that day called me. He said, I was just talking to somebody at Red River, and you know what's going on up there today? I said, what? He said, remember that big old maple tree we had the meeting under? I said, yeah. He said, well, they're cutting that tree down today because it got struck by lightning, and they're afraid the next storm is going to take it down on top of the old meeting house and crush it. I said, what are they doing with the tree? He said, they're taking it away to burn it. I said, no, they're not. That's my tree. Yeah, you can't take that tree away and burn it. I'm going to take that, I'm going to turn that tree into guitars. It's got a song to sing. I'm going to turn that tree into uh, ink pens. I'm going to turn it, and that's what I started doing. I sent somebody, brought an entire tree laying on its side was over five feet tall that was there during the days of the revival. Semi-load of, uh, of, of wood brought all the way to Alabama, milled that thing up, and I'm going to turn it into, I'm going to turn it into storytelling. And so, uh, let, let me show you what I did. All right. Let me show you real quick. I can, just, I can just get this thing right open. I want you to see this. So what I do is on cold nights and rainy days, I make handmade ink pens out of it. And I say, you know what this is? My, my creative expression is going to be a means by which we can tell the stories of what happened with James McGreedy and what happened with Barton Stone, what happened with the old women and so on. So out of my creative process and the labor of love, I make these ink pens. Cold nights, all night, rainy days, and, uh, and, and I sell them. And it, just, just in case some of you think this is a, com uh, you know, is this a commercial, this is a commercial, okay? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't want any confusion around this, all right? You got this? I, I sell these things. I hand make and sell them. And, uh, and they're expensive. They're, they're, a, they're a very high-end quality pen. They're not, they don't cost as much as a Mont Blanc that go from 300 to 3,000, some even to 18,000. But these are 
incredibly wonderful pens. And uh, I sell them for $120 each. And it goes to missions. And, it, and, it, and uh, so I, no, no uh, shame or embarrassment whatsoever. They'll be available. And here's what I did. Like that one there is called, that one there is called communion because it's got like a con communion top on, uh, on it. That's to honor what happened there. And that's communion times. This, that's called a, a scribe. This is called a missionary. It honors St. Patrick and St. Columba and some of those who moved in signs and wonders and miracles in those Celtic lands. It's got the Celtic thing that's called a circuit rider. It honors uh, people like James McGreedy and, and, uh, and uh, what's the other boy? Uh, anyway. And, uh, uh, and then uh, there's, these are called Prophet of the Long Road. And those pens honor uh, Francis Asbury preached uh, 300,000 miles on horseback. He knew what sacrifice and obedience was. And from horseback for, for 45 years he preached and established churches all over, in this town. He, they established churches between, between he and a, and, uh, and a, and a fellow uh, called Lorenzo Dow. And, uh, and the, and the, but anyway, they all have a story that's connected to them. You get a card with the story and you get a a presentation kind of thing you can do with it. Now, when I started doing this, the, these all, all these over here from Cane Ridge, and these are from Red River. And then what happened was somebody showed up at my house one day and said, I felt like the Lord wanted me to bring you this, and they brought me the windows, the doors, the door frames, the flooring, and the mantle from Billy Graham's childhood home. And that pen is made from the bedroom window of Billy Graham's bedroom as a as a young boy when he would sit and look out the window and dream. And, uh, and I'm not even, those are not even on the website. I'm not going to put them on the website. I, I, it feels, you know, I don't want it to feel funny. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to feel like, you know, Billy Graham is going to heaven and we're going to, no, I, I gave some to, uh, to uh, Franklin and that kind of thing. And it's, it's supposed to be honor. But if someone, I only, and I only carry like one at a time or whatever. And then, a pastor in Indianapolis brought me a big block of wood from Indianapolis and this because they had just cut the tree as he was walking by over Mariah Woodworth Edder's grave in Indianapolis. And then a few weeks ago, someone brought me all of the windows out of Charles Finney's home. And it's just not stopping. And, uh, and because this is, a, I call it, you're holding history and writing the future. And when you present someone with something as, a, as an heirloom or a gift like that, yes. now they, they'll, they'll go and seek out the story. It's, you'd be amazed at how many times I'll be in like an, I was on an airplane one day, writing along with, one my, with my pen, and I'm writing along there in my leather journal, and this lady says, excuse me, that's an interesting pen you have there. I said, yeah, I make that, I make it myself. And she said, really? And I said, yeah, did you ever hear of James McGreedy? And pretty soon, I just start telling her the whole, whole story. And she's sitting there hearing this fascinating story. I didn't know what, really. And, and, and so I go back to writing, and she interrupts me again. She says, well, sir, excuse me. Do you mind to tell me, what are you writing with that pen? And I said, no, I don't mind to tell you at all. I'm, ri I'm writing a letter to my great-grandson. He said, she, she said, do you have a great-grandson? I said, no, but I will when he gets this letter. <laughs> I'm going to leave it right there. You hear what I'm saying? How, how much do we, how, how are the many, ways? what if, what if there were churches that are rising up that not just the next church that sounds kind of like Bethel and kind of like Kansas City or kind of like uh, Hillsong, well, what if there was churches rising up with the uniqueness of the voice that they were created to carry? What if there were churches rising up that hurt their, uh, establishing storytellers? Look how many storytellers are in this church. I wonder how valuable that would be to culture as we begin to, whatever we value, we celebrate, and what we celebrate, we invite. What are we going to invite in the Huntsville in the future? Are we going to stay on defense or are we going to be a people that carry encounters? And God has created a, re a reservoir 
of these great encounters down through time. Maybe it's time for whole new expressions of worship. When David established the tabernacle of David, he had those to thank, to praise, and to zakar, or to remember and tell his mighty acts. How long has it been since you told your story? Now, I told you, now this is my real life's closing. I was just in Scotland on a rainy night in January. Rain blowing, gale force winds, couldn't do anything, so I jumped on the Google. And I got on the Google and I got to trying to figure out if, if Red River was the same kind of communion service, being Scottish Presbyterian, that there was in Scotland, the three, that whole thing. And that's where I found out that information. But you know what else I found out? I found out while digging around in that, I found out that James McGreedy, this powerful preacher that preached there, he did not sustain the revival. Who sustained the revival? Because out of that old Calvinist theology, turn or burn, go to hell, predest that stuff, it created this, you know, rigid thing. And back in North Carolina, there was a fellow named Sam McAdoo. And Sam had just lost his wife. And he was in a tender place in his life. And James McGreedy said, Samuel, would you come and help me preach this revival where thousands are coming to the Lord? Would you come and help me? And out of his brokenness, he came, but he came with a different message. And it was the tenderness of God, the love of God, the beauty of God, and uh, the mercy of God. And he's the one that preached the Red River Revival. And while I was studying that, I noticed his name Samuel McAdoo. Wait a minute. That's when I found out. And I just had my genealogy professionally done. And Samuel McAdoo is my eighth great-grandfather. And all those years ago, I took our entire church up there because I wanted them to know what our fathers had done. I didn't know it was one of mine. And uh, God's awesome. So anyways, they, these are going to be somewhere at the table. And I'll be there too. I'll, co I'll come running and just answer any questions you have if anybody wants them. And, uh, and again, that's the way we support missions. Can I, can I just end by praying for y'all? It's been a long meeting and, and uh, thank you for your patience. And, and, uh, but you know what? I wouldn't have missed tonight for anything. Lord, awaken our stories. Awaken our songs. Lord, let us value what you desire to do in Huntsville, Alabama. And Lord, we, so many times we attempt to confine your doings with the limits of our knowings. But Lord, we're asking you tonight to give us your knowings, not our knowings. I wonder how many calls and anointings are on the lives of the people in this room just waiting for the day that we can come fully alive to them. And I wonder how many times in our lives, if we started looking back at our own stories of our own lives, how many times we would find that he was there all the time, sowing his doings and desires into your yearnings. I was raised the son of a well digger. My father was a well digger. And when I was a little boy, one time I looked into an old well and I saw the sky. And 
And somehow or another, God was awakening something in me that is still alive today because I've been looking in old wells for heaven ever since. I also remember as a little boy, about six or eight years old, a well that my daddy had dug, I laid my head on the side of that well and I listened to the world's oldest music. And I wonder if I was actually having, in, today I wonder, was I actually having encounters with my destiny? Because nothing brings more life to me than digging the, those old wells and bringing that hidden water that's way below the surface of Christianity and seemingly lost. But there's a sound of heaven that are in these old wells and we really do need to bring that water back to the surface again. And so I want to pray, this is my prayer, that all of those times in your life that God was doing those wondrous things that was putting dreams in your heart and putting purpose in your future, I want to pray that this be a time that you become the well diggers that you were created to be, the singers that you dreamed you'd be when you were seven, the preachers that are, are even more than that. Just, I'm going to ask that the Lord begin to go back and collect all those times that he was speaking his love to your life and let you begin to remember them in such a way that they have to be told. Because those who value those encounters and celebrate those encounters welcome encounters. And so I want to just pray that this be a season of fresh new encounters that reach back and collect all those expressions of his love to your life and that your story be fully, fully lived and nothing lost. What about all those years of love? No. We're going to look back at every moment that he showed his love to you and it's going to awaken the story of who you were created to be. Lord, I bless this house today, and I'm, Lord, I bless the leaders of, these, of this, these churches, leaders of these homes, the lovers of God that come into this place every week, these lovers that have become listeners and learners, born to carry the language of who you are. I pray, Lord, now that you will create a supernatural articulation of the beauty of who you are through the truths that will be lived out through these creative ones that sit in this room tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Just sit there a minute. Just sit there with him a minute. Thing that your heart was born to be right now.